And I, I, I here I mean the culture, right? The institutions, the family you live in, the church that you attend, the, the schools that are there in Thessaloniki. How does the world you live in, the things we Americans might call Greece or old school Greece, how does it differ from the world you grew up in? I mean, you were born in Dallas. I think you should be a cowboy fan. Hello and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's a podcast aimed at folks who, I don't know, feel a sense of dislocation in our modern world. On this pod, we talk about heavy things. We do it lightly. We're going to use theology, history, and philosophy, years of deeply immersive experiences in foreign cultures to figure out what the hell is going on. Our pod goes beyond rhetorical rabbits. Things quickly spread and reproduced on the, on the internet. Instead, we dig down, look at contemporary culture from an old world perspective. Join me, John Hears, our team of First Things field workers, as we wonder aloud, why are we talking about rabbits? And that sound you hear behind us is our guest today. He is a priest and a great representative of the old world, and he is also my brother. Uh, Father, brother, Peter Hears. I say father, brother. Hi, Peter. How are you, father? Good? Thanks, thanks be to God. It's good to be here, John. How you doing? So right off the bat, before I give the, your, the specs on who you are, I'm going to call you Father Peter during this interview. How does that make you feel <laughs> coming from your older brother? That sounds good to me. It's my you kids love call it. Me. You love my, it. My kids call me that, so I, I'm pretty used to it, actually. So it's yeah, one, of my, know. one of those weird things that, that happen in the here's, here's household. Yeah, what did you just do to me right there? You, did I, <laughs> am I your kid suddenly? Weird. No, no. I used I'm to used to it. I'm used to it. Pummel you and... You remember we'd play baseball and you would lose to me because I was big and strong and you were just a young kid. And now I'm your child. Yeah. Yeah. You were you were much better in sports, that's for sure. Yeah. You had the one on the one up on me. I think though it's a I think it's a consensus among our people that you're much smarter than I am. <laughs> Damn well, no. it, it, it's, Do I it's have not- to concede that? I don't think that's an issue of smart. That's not the question. It's right? because you're a priest and that's what it is. It's like, mom's like one of those Italian moms from a mafia movie. Like, don't worry, he's my priest. He's my son. I love him. <laughs> is that it? Uh, mom is listening to this. This is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so who are we talking to? For folks of, who like our pod, the uh, Why Are We Talking About Rabbits pod, this is Father Peter Hears. Uh, he's been a priest for like 20 years now, right? More or less. Yeah. Um, yeah. You were the professor of Holy Scripture and, and remain a professor of dogmatic theology at Jordanville up in upstate New York, right? Holy Trinity Seminary. Uh-huh. Holy Trinity Seminary. You've written, edited, and translated lots of books, including The Missionary Origins of Modern Ecumenism, uh, The Ecclesi- Ecclesiological Renovation of the Second Vatican Council. That's your second uh-huh. book. Is that right? Uh-huh. That's correct. These are all be in the uh, pod notes, by the way. They'll be linked because they're fascinating reads. I love them. The second book on the Second Vatican Council, it it actually changed the way that I saw modern America as per the way we talk on this podcast. It's an important book. Um, and you translated a lot of books, including the life of Elder Paisios, uh, the epistles of Elder Paisios. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The truth, truth of our faith. Uh, by Elder Cleopa, and then a book that I love and we use in our work at First Things Foundation, The Apostle to Zaire, The Life of Father Cosmos. And, um, well, there's one more book uh, the, that I tell everybody about. is It's a children's book from Iville to Uville, which I got to tell you this. I was just up at a, a really cool little Greek um, market that doubles as a uh, restaurant that doubles as a cultural center. And of course I mentioned your name. Don't ever do that with Greeks. <laughs> and then they're just trying to give me stuff. 
it. <laughs> they love you, man, because essentially you moved to Greece 20 years ago and became Greek, but not really. <laughs> You're like a centaur or like one of those griffins, those birds that's an eagle body with, or it's an eagle head with a lion's body. Like you can do both. You're like a <laughs> Greek American superhero guy. You know, there's a song in Greek. I should probably say this now. There's a song in Greek that pretty much people say, this is what I, this is, this, this epitomizes what I am. And it's, I've lived this. So it's, the song is, uh, goes basically like this. It's, uh, when I'm abroad, I'm a Greek. And when I'm in Greece, I'm a stranger, I'm a foreigner. And <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much it. I go abroad, people are like, oh, you're from Greece. And then I come back to Greece and like, oh, you're, you're, you're from abroad. So I don't know where I am. I'm because somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, usually, you know, back and forth before. Between We're going to talk about that because I think fundamentally that's, of course, you're my brother and I love you, but you're a unique person to speak to sort of the the essence or the ethos of our pod so we'll get to that but tell us what you're doing right now primarily you still do a number of you're obviously deeply involved in literature and production of it. one one of, one of the things that we didn't mention we forgot to mention was that i was a i was the headmaster of uh three hierarchs academy ah. down in arizona for about a year and a half and that was a tremendous experience that ended ended about six eight months ago so i'm back in greece and we um you know We've been wanting to do this for a long time, and because of all the you know worldwide crisis and everything, it really kind of pr- propelled us to just just jump in and start a podcast, uh, the Orthodox Ethos Podcast, which is on YouTube. And I didn't know what to expect, but within just about I don't know two months, we we went from from our our, our YouTube channel went from just a few thousand to six thousand uh, subscribers, and now we're up to ten thousand. <clears throat> 10,000. So obviously there's a huge, there's a huge need. There's a huge need that we're fulfilling. Somebody, something is uh, touching a vein with, with Orthodox that are seeking, I think, uh, mainly new world Orthodox. They're seeking to explain, you know, in a traditional Orthodox way to understand, explain, uh, you know, what's going on in particular, what's going on right now, the last six months with this, you know, COVID crisis and everything. But but really much more than that. I mean, there's so much more going on. There's, there's been going on for, for decades, or at least you know, a decade in the Orthodox Church. So, uh, so that's taken off. And then we just started last month uh, a, a new online presence platform at Patreon, and we're offering courses. We're offering courses. Mm-hmm. And the first course we did was uh, we're offering right now. We're just finishing up the first uh, introductory section. We're going to be doing the sixth lecture next week. And that is Orthodox Survival Course. And that's based on, uh, it's my, it's not, it's, it's my, uh, you know, take on how I, how I would do now what Father Seraphim Rose did uh, 40 years ago, or mm-hmm. maybe even 50 years ago now, in the 1970s in, uh, in Platina, California, a well-known uh, writer, higher monk, you know, many people consider him a saint <clears throat> of the Orthodox Church, undeclared. And he uh, started something called the Orthodox Survival Course, but he was, of course, much more qualified. He was in a tremendous mind and, and an academic, but also a great uh, church, church um, ecclesiastical man. And so he went back from the schism of the, of the papal schism from the Orthodox Church in the 10th century, uh, 11th century. He, he, he traced the history of the Western world and all of the movements, the spiritual and intellectual movements up to our data to, to be able to give to his listeners at the time uh, let's say the antibodies are the answer to what is going on, I understand the modern world. And so therefore to be protected by all the various spiritual uh, viruses that exist in the contemporary culture. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to continue in that vein and honor him, but also just continue in that vein and try to do the same thing, the same aim, which is to give to the people who are listening, the, uh, the ability to interpret, understand on the, on the, within the Orthodox Christian tradition, what's going on in the world. So we're finishing up the first, uh, first introductory section. We're going to continue in the fall mm-hmm. with, uh, with, with several classes, probably God willing, we're going to be talking about the, um, the book of revelation, most likely. We're also going to be doing a, a course on the Orthodox survival course by Father Sarah from Rose. And maybe we'll do a, a, a fundamentals of the Orthodox faith, like introductory for catechumens and others, and possibly use my book to do an Orthodox uh, ecclesiology course. So there's a lot, a lot going on. So the offerings can be found on Orthodox Ethos and Patreon. So you go, you can go to our, oh, there's also our website, orthodoxethos.com. You can go there and find an announcement uh, for the course. 
Uh, you can go to Patreon, just Patreon slash Father Peter Hears, FR Peter Hears. Uh, you can also um, we'll put it access all on the pod it. Notes. Yeah, we'll yeah, it'll all be there. On the pod yeah. Notes. Yeah. But the, the point is, is that currently that's a, a lot of your time, a lot of your efforts are spent. Yes, yeah, a lot of my, a lot of my time. Because we're, we're doing five hours of lecture in a week, well, but about an hour and a half, two hours of lecture, and then three, three hours or so of question and answer. People have tons of questions. So a lot of our time is taken up with uh, answering their questions. And so these are both... Orthodox and non-Orthodox people, these are both secret. I mean, anybody can join, of course. There are a lot of people who are not uh, uh, yet uh, baptized. There are a lot of catechumens, inquirers. I, I've noticed gotcha, that. I mean, gotcha. we're up to 700, 720 people uh, so far. So a uh, number of them are, are inquirers in the Orthodox faith. Let's put it that way. Let's, we'll get back to that because I think that's really what this pod is about like what are you presenting and why is it resonating and what is the new world and what is the old but first won't you brother take the light meter test with me <laughs> wouldn't first be it wouldn't all, be the wouldn't be the rabbit show right without right, the well, come on man. without like, the letter matter what if you said no then i would have to kick you off the show <laughs> so look yeah. f- first of all the light meter test for people who are listening the first it's a it's a scientific, t- I, if I could, I would hook you up with those things, those nodes that I put on your head, but I can't because <laughs> I can't because you're not here. But it's so scientific that it will literally blow your mind, this test I'm about to give you. And the reason we have it on this show for all of our guests is because in some ways, a lot of people that come to this pod are thinking, what is he talking about? Light world, the, the, the new world, old world. And what we're really talking about is a way of thinking uh, or a way of being. And so one of many people, in fact, but one person in particular said, well, how do I know what I am? And then we designed this. This is like, think of, think of Newton the, or, or maybe of Einstein. Or, this, is, this is that important to the world. Are you ready to take the light meter test to find out what you are in terms of it. the light meter spectrum, new world, old world? Here we go. You're going to answer on a scale of three to zero. Three means you are fully behind the answer. <clears throat> Two mm-hmm. is, is, well, somewhat. One is, is, I don't really think that's true. And zero is, is I have no confidence that what you just said is good or true. Zero is heck no. Three is heck yes. Got it? Got it. Remember, this is science. First question. Father Peter, when you die, you won't really die all the way. It's more like you'll be sleeping or something, waiting for a new world, some sort of next world. Three, two, one, zero. You can say your answer out loud. Oh, yeah. That's a a three. Three. Yeah. I think everyone's out there going, what if he said zero? (laughs) Second question. The best way to get to know me, or sorry, the best way to get to know you Father Peter, is to ask someone else about you. Uh, that's probably... Scary. That's probably a one. That's probably a one. Right one. There. One. Yeah. Interesting. So, well, well, let's talk about that in a minute. When I carry a picture of a friend or a parent, when you carry a picture or you put a picture up in your house, the picture sort of makes them there in some way they actually sort of are more there than if you didn't put the picture up uh that's a two two here's one your fourth question respect isn't earned it is owed by you to others that's a three oh and the fifth question when you one of the whole points of getting older is so that you can have a place where you can bring your parent and they get all old and confused and you can take care of them in your very house, the house that you live in. The whole goal is to get there so you can take care of your parents and live with them in their house. I mean, uh, in your house. Well, I mean, I don't know if I'd put it that way, but yeah, I would think that every child should take care of their parents and have them. So that's a three. So that is something you're hoping or that you would think is a very, very right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Let's add this up. Three, six, nine, 10, 12. You scored a 12 
on the lighter meter. That's 12 out of 15 total points. Is that good? Let me tell you what that means. Now, this is where, you know, this can be, this could change your life. Are you ready? You're at 12. Father Peter, you're the villager. The old world is in your bones. There's a really good chance you hate malls a lot. <laughs> Places like Algeria, Ethiopia, they roll out the red carpet for you. Your Spotify collection includes chants from, from people that, whose language you barely even speak, and you love that you can't understand the language. You just love that the chants are so old, and you wish there was more hierarchy in the world. You are a villager, Father Peter. True. Congratulations. I actually do live in a village. So it's a very good, you're, you have a scientific test on that. I uh, told you it's, it's not amazing. failed one time. It's amazing. Yeah. All my friends in LA, threes, <laughs> twos, and ones. All yeah. my friends in Greece, well, you, 12. <laughs> that's amazing. There you go. Yeah. So I want to know about the picture thing, though, because I, I don't know if that's, I, you see, I kind of was going on toward the one there, but I think I said it too. I mean, we like in the village, we like to see each other, right? So tell me about the why is that an old world thing? Well, <clears throat> that's great. So thank you for asking. So, in our work, First Things Foundation is the one who sponsors this pod. We send people overseas and we often start them in, in immersion ships, we call them, which are internships with local, 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 local people. So, sometimes with folks who have not even attended school working on a carpentry project, but our guys get immersed in the culture, learn the local language, including in, we started in Ethiopia, we did this in Sierra Leone, lots of places. We're doing it in the States now too. Here's my point. Whenever we get over there, what we see in the old world is that image is it really essential to understanding being. So, for instance, if you take a picture of someone in a lot of these cultures, including in Guatemala where we work, it's, it's really important what you're going to do with the picture because the picture can actually make the person present in a way. So, in, in the Eastern Christian tradition, the icon is like a window. It, the, suddenly, the, the, the saint is present, which you know more about this than I do. And so, the idea that you put a picture of your grandmother up is more than just like, oh, remember her. It's a type of remembering, putting, mm -hmm. put her, putting her mm -hmm. back together uh, mm -hmm. in your presence, not perhaps as incarnate, but in some ways. And so, what I find is in the old world, that, that idea is very, it's very present. It, it, regardless whether it's a Christian or Muslim or whatever it is, it, there's something really present about the, about the image. Um, I'm having Father Siloan Justiniano on the show to talk about this very thing. He's an icon painter. I think you two have met. Yeah, yeah. You've met. Yeah, we did. Up does that York. help? With that yeah, that question? does. That help. That puts a lot more flesh on it. If it was probably posited slightly differently, I would have gone three. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are sure. you challenging the science of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> may, may, maybe you need to rethink about the. You're asking a, a almost third world person now. You know, have to repackage <laughs> the questioning to make it <laughs> to make it understandable. That's well. Uh, I'll have to. I guess we'll go back. It's an iterative thing. All scientific <laughs> endeavors. So. <laughs> Yes. Right. You know, you, you have empirical knowledge now from the field, so you might have to make. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the lighter meter test. This show is about trying to figure out, okay, what's happening in our modern culture? And it's really for Americans and Westerners. And you're mm -hmm. overseas. You're this, this griffin, this centaur. So talk to me for a second. How does the world you live in, and I, I here I mean the culture, right? The institutions, the family you live in, the church that you attend, the the schools that are there in Thessaloniki. How does the world you live in, the things we Americans might call Greece or old school Greece, how does it differ from the world you grew up in? I mean, you were born in Dallas. I think you should be a cowboy fan. Like, what's happening? What's the difference between something I might call old world and new world, in your humble opinion? Mm. Well, it's interesting because modern Greece is, is in many ways, uh, got both. Uh, it's, right, it's got the old world and the new world right side by side. And it's gone, gone through uh, uh, almost a, you know, 
a sped up process of modernization overnight, you know? So if, if we were in my village 60, 70 years ago, it would be very much similar to the village 300 or 400 years ago. Mm. So think about that for a minute, 60, 70, 80 years, since, really since the Second World War, this village has gone through a tr- total transformation. It didn't have a road to it until the 70s. So you, to get to this village up in the mountains here outside Thessaloniki, you would have to go by dirt road. And people didn't go much except to sell their goods and come back. So, so you know, my old timers here who work in, in this, unfortunately, most villages in Greece have gone old timer because of urbanization. That's the single most transformative thing in modern Greece is urbanization. Mm-hmm. It did more to undo the old world and undo the life of the church, which was the center of the village. For, for ages and ages, right? That, that urbanization, the, the, out, the emptying of the villages. So that, that whole process, which we're at the end now, it's been it's really completed and now we're in village, most of the villages are, are the median age is like 70, right? So, <clears throat> so that, that means that we are living both new world and old world in many ways. And, and we're seeing the old world, you know, trying to keep as much possible, to keep alive as much as possible through, uh, basically the church. I mean, the church is the main conduit for keeping continuity with the past in Greece. And so the people who are a part of the church are looking for those same tr- values that existed 50, 100, 500 years ago. And of course, those values are going to be family, community, and and the church. And all those things are, are inseparable. They're, 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 there's a um, seamless garment there, right? Do you, so, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. So I so I think that's the biggest difference with the new world. Old world is going to be that focus. That that, is, that historical memory is a huge difference. Like like you know in a, in America, history is not that important for a lot of people in my experience, and we didn't learn much of it in high school. Mm-hmm. Whereas history is very much alive and very much a part of everyone's life here. So when they talk about things. For instance, they talk about our relationship with our neighbor here, Turkey, and it's very problematic right now. They're on the verge of war. Uh, it's very common for people to talk about something that happened 600 years ago, which was the fall of Constantinople. Mm-hmm. So history is, is very much alive. You know, the, they just turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Well, that Hagia Sophia dates back to the 5th century, right? So this is something that, that, that binds us in this little village or in Greece all the way back to the fifth century, it's very much alive for us. It's a part of our, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a historical memory, but it's a current uh, event that's going on in, in our lives and affects us. So there's so much of that and history is so much alive, which is not the case uh, for the most part in America. And I think that affects, uh, because there's so forward looking, progress looking, uh, and uh, that, that, that totally affects their, their, their outlook and their values, what is important to them in life, right? And so, and then of course, the other big thing is, is continuity and family. So our, our grandfather left when he was a teenager, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Dimitri, Dimitri, right? He came to America, our, my, mm-hmm. our mother from, from Lamia down here in, in central Greece, he left Greece, went to America and married a German. They went to the Anglican church. That's what you do, right? You compromise between the Orthodox and the Lutherans. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, that, he came back to Greece once. So that continuity with his past was essentially broken. Right? And, and, and if I hadn't come back to Greece, there would be, there would be no real no. presence for our, in our family of, of any of that. Maybe as Orthodox, we would have something because we came to Orthodoxy. But, you know, in terms of the Greek people, the Greek language, the Greek, that would have been lost entirely to us. Right. Like, for instance, right now, watch me. I'm going to speak Greek to you. <laughs> See that? <laughs> See what happened there right there? there you, you did it well. How was that? Actually, silence, as you said in your in your, what are your, your introduction to the uh, to the uh, Lido meter, silence is one of the main uh, things you hear in the, in a Greek village up in the mountains. That's interesting. So y- you were speaking a little bit of Greek uh, <laughs> without That's knowing. <laughs> interesting, but so, yeah, yeah. So the continuity was broken for our for our for our papu. Yeah, it, it was. Go back then for a second. Did you have to acquire this way of thinking? Was it something, because when you went back, I mean, tell us about the early years when you went and lived in Greece, because you really didn't come home for, I I mean, it was years and years, right? Did you have to acquire this, this what, what you seemingly are calling old world understanding, or did it reside within you? Is it something 
is it real? Is it even real? This thing mm. we're calling old world. Well, yeah, I think it is real, and it's 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 uh, it's subconscious for the Greeks, though. So you, there's tons of Greeks who don't really who've been alienated from that on one level, like for instance, orthodoxy, there's a lot of Greeks who are apostates or just not interested or just, you know, very superficial. So that probably wasn't, the numbers were not the same 50, 60 years ago, although secularism has been going on for generations and generations. Um, so, but even among those who are not, not active members of the Orthodox Church, there's in, in them without them even realizing it. And you can tell that, I can tell that as somebody who came to Greece late in life, that, 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 that what they're carrying with them without really even acknowledging it and maybe even honoring it is that old world uh, outlook which values things that are not valued in the new world like the family, like tradition, like uh, history, uh, like uh, you know, the, 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 the slow way of life, sitting down and, and seeing eye to eye, drinking a coffee, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. all these things that are the, the old slow pace which is still they seek out, even if they're in the midst of this, of this you know, increasingly fast-paced, uh, insane way of life, they're all looking for that, you know, whether mm -hmm. they, they, they want that. And it's, and it's not something people have to like think about. It just comes. So yeah, I think that it's, it's, just, it's just subconscious. It's not something that they're putting on. And that's one of the things you actually see the difference with some of the Greeks abroad is that they've been separated from it and now they're in search of it. And so there's, or there's others who are coming to it and they're, they're trying to put it on, but it, you, you can't really do that. You, you know, just I have see, to be immersed in it. I see the same in our work. Uh, when we meet with Guatemalans or Sierra Leoneans or Malians here that have become Americanized, it's exactly what you're describing. Um, they're, they're trying to reclaim something here all the time because they're afraid they're losing it. Now, on the other hand, let me let's just put this at you because I think it's really important. What would you say to somebody, and I might even be that somebody who said, come on, man, but this is how history works. Things go and progress. And are you, are you really trying to reclaim and, and hold on or, or go back to something? Is, is that really even possible? And doesn't that just make you sort of a Luddite of culture, just, you know, bound to old ideas that eventually die out? Well, you, you, you're a part of, you become a part of a living tradition. So no, you can't go back and put on different clothing and walk around. I mean, there, there was a story, someone, I think Elder Athanas Mithirineos was talking about someone, talking about modesty, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what should a man and a woman wear that's uh, appropriate for a Christian, for instance? And he, and he talked about this guy who would walk around in these ancient Greek clothing in a village. And so... He obviously it's ridiculous that no, you can't do that. You can't like I'm going to be a person of a different age. But the the whole point here is that it's not something I need to go back to. It's something that exists and I join into. It's a mm -hmm. living, raging water, you know, stream or, or, or river that I enter into. And if I don't, then I then I then I don't. I mean, it doesn't you can't do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. And and that 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 carrier, that, that conduit that brings us to us to this day, at least in the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox world, is the church. For the most part, the church is. Now, there are, there are all, as I said, it's, the whole culture has been baptized and been immersed in a Orthodox Roman, you know, Romanity, the old Roman Empire that, that, that continued in, in the core of Greek tradition. That's, that's, a, that's there, whether you're faithful or not. But without the church, everybody knows in Greece, without the church during the Turkish period, for instance, there would be no Greek identity today. Ah, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, as an American who now believes, uh, well, not believes, but lives a Greek identity here, meaning an Orthodox identity, what do you see as the American identity, the new world identity? What, what, what is that? What is that to you? You don't have to, it's not science. You don't have to be right, but you do have to try to answer as, as my little brother. Mm. What is that identity? I think the biggest difference that what, what would define it for me is individualism, the, the value of the individual, the rights of the individual, the success and the, the progress and the American dream and all that, which is very much focused and stressed in America. It really is not as much in Greece. You don't, people don't, you know, there's no Greek dream, you know, there, everybody, everybody That's has a right to, there's no, everybody doesn't have a right to be, you know, successful or, uh, or, 
um, it, it's very communal here. Like it's mm-hmm. the Greek people. We talk about us. We don't talk about me and I as much. Now, in so much as that's been eroded by uh, a Westernization and an Americanization, then that's been eroded. But mm-hmm. if you're really talking about something separate and not been been uh, undermined within the last you know 150 years, then that's what you're talking about. And it's it's very much us here. Does that change the way that Greeks understand, say, the concept of human rights? I mean, is there such a thing as a human right in a more communal society? Um, for do, what would you say about that? Sure, there, sure. There's respect for the person. Yeah, I think. There, and but I don't think they would, they would put it in terms of rights as a, as a, as as in terms of respect, mutual respect, and um, it's mutual support. Uh, I mean, Greek Greece is, after all, the birthplace of democracy. There's going to be there's there's there is there is this idea of of people having uh, the gov the, the the society, the government, the culture, the people respecting individuals and their and and very much stressed in Orthodoxy and in Greek Greek Greece is is the freedom of each individual. So it's very anathema in Orthodoxy and therefore among the Greek people for the idea that we're going to pressure people into being uh, orthodox or, or anything really. So, so in, that se- in that sense, the freedom, is, the freedom of the individual is very much respected, but it's not put in the, it's not stressed the individual rights uh, as much as, as you would in, in America. How would you, as a, as a priest of the orthodox tradition, how would you describe a human? Because we did a pod on this. It seems you got to start with, if you're going to talk about human rights, you got to start with the concept of a human. What what is a human being, just theologically? Well, the teaching which goes back to the Book of Genesis uh, and is very much at the center of Orthodox theology in, in terms of the human person, the anthropology, is that man is created in the image and likeness of God. This phrase is extremely important. And, and all the way up to today, if you want to understand Orthodox spiritual life, Orthodox anthropology, you've got to understand what that phrase. So what does it mean to be creating the image and likeness? Um, the image uh, of God is, and is um, that which was given uh, in, in his, he was created according to the prototype, right? Who is Christ actually, right? Christ, the incarnate Christ. He's the prototype. He's the image that we're created after. Uh, and in the in in the in the fall, we lost when man fell away from God, uh, and he disobeyed and did not did not repent of that disobedience, but remained in that disobedience. Then he fell away from the communion with God, and he lost the image, the not entirely, but it was blackened. And then the likeness was lost totally. And the likeness is to be virtuous. It's to be like God in, in his love and in his mercy and in all of his virtues, right? So in the Orthodox Church, the, the, the whole struggle now is, is to go from the image, which has been restored through baptism and, and life in the church, to the likeness, which is to acquire the virtues and to be like Christ in all, in all the things that he was. So, so we actually believe the purpose of a man's of a human being's life is to become like Christ totally, and to become a God by grace, that's actually a phrase from the patristic teachings, which means that the things that you saw in Christ, it, all the way up into the, the miracles and everything, it's possible for human beings to participate and to, ex, to express those things by grace of God, by the gift of God, by the participation of God and our participation in his life. So that would be the purpose of life. And so everything would be in that context, right? It'd be in the context of the image and likeness and going from the image to the likeness. That would be how we would understand human, who a human being is, where he came from, and where he's, he's aiming to go. Okay, so and, stop, because this is interesting. You would say that applies to every human walking around. That is what a human is and who's, I don't know, you know, professor at, I don't know, Oberlin College. That's that guy. He's that guy. He is... Mm-hmm in God's image, whether or not he or she thinks that about themselves, it would still apply to them. Would you say that? Sure. Yes. And so if that applies to them, well, is- the, the being in the image, but if they're not participating in the grace of God, they're not going from the image, they're not restored 
according to the image, to the likeness. That happens when we participate in the life of God and the life of Christ in the church. So they have, every human being has the image, but it's, if it's not been restored by Christ, it's, a, it's an image that's been tarnished. What's the restoration look like? How does that work? The restoration is this whole process of healing that happens in the, in the hospital, which is the church. So just like, just like we're sick in body, we're sick in soul. And so we have to, we have to be uh, regenerated and renewed uh, spiritually. And that happens through the mysteries of the church, through baptism, chrismation, communion. That whole process is the whole life of the church. That's why we're Christians. We don't, there's no other reason to be a Christian. Don't go to church for any other reason but to be totally restored, to be regenerated, to be mm-hmm. to be uh, to become a human, new human being, and so that's uh, that's the purpose of life. And so we wouldn't see any all all of life's can be seen in that paradigm. So stick with me on this because this is this is I think where our pod interests people. So work with me because I'm a new worlder in that I am in the new world and I'm encrusted by my with all kinds of American cultural realities. And a lot of them I like. So stick with me or Steve Smith. And now I don't count because I kind of know what you're talking about. And I believe, but check this out. Steve Smith, that professor that in Ohio, he says, I am participating in the growth. I am participating. I'm on that, that, that I'm, I'm on that, um, that continuum. I'm doing it in my way. And uh, a human right is my right to do it my way. What do you say to that, Kat? Sure. Sure, everyone's free. Everyone's free to choose their path. And if they think that uh, uh, they, they can save themselves, um, we, would, we as Orthodox would respect that desire and their, their freedom to do that. But we would also answer that um, uh, to be a fallen person needs a, a hand to be lifted up someone else needs to save them. And that's uh, self deification doesn't exist for us. There's nothing I can do without God. I cannot be restored. So we would say, you know, sure. There's, there's a lot you can do to be a good person. There's a lot of things you can do to be a good citizen. There's a lot of things you can do to be, you know, a quote unquote moral person, if you want to call it that, but none of that is the purpose of life. Like that, that, that ends with the grave. So that's not gonna that's not gonna be a true restoration of the human person. So a person, let's stick with Steve Smith. He teaches his classes. He works hard. He raises his children. He actually chooses on a couple occasions um, humility over pride, and he chooses on one occasion to give away a ton of money instead of hoard it for himself, and he dies. He's he's grown morally. Is that what's going on there? But he hasn't made steps toward a a more complete restoration as per the image of God. How, and by the way, there's no judgment in this, which I'm just trying to figure out for our listeners. Like, yeah, where yeah, is this absolutely. old world thing coming from? Like, what are you yeah, And by say? the way, this is, this is part and parcel of the old world, whether you're in Greece or wherever you are. I mean, the, one of the things Father Seraphim Rose teaches is, and, and so true is that the only in the West did you have a Renaissance an enlightenment, an industrial revolution. Everywhere else in the world, whether Orthodox or not, uh, whether Christian or not, you went from old world to new world within a very short amount of time mm-hmm. for the most part. That's interesting. And so, yeah. and so it, it, it's, this does, some people might say, well, what, what does religion have to do with it? Or something? This has everything to do with it. I mean, old world, you cannot talk about old world if you don't talk about these foundational uh, uh, theological, philosophical uh, questions about human beings and their purpose in life and all the rest. So I think heavy it is things, very- heavy things lightly. Yeah. That's what the, we're yeah. trying to do right now. So yeah. go ahead. I want yeah. to. So, so, so Steve uh, Smith uh, uh, is, uh, is struggling according to his, you know, human ability to, to do good things. And that's all very good. Uh, but, but how does that solve the question of death? How does that solve the question, the problem of death? How does it solve the problem of the internal life, uh, which which is oftentimes a, a closed book uh, to to us, uh, we can do good things, actions, uh, but the, there's an internal world in the human person that needs to be regenerated, and that doesn't happen by good acts, right? There's a, that's of course this is a huge theological spiritual question that we're opening mm-hmm. up here, but 
But I, I think as long as we remain on the level of external acts and goodwill and things like that, we're never going to heal the whole man. And the whole man includes the heart, the noose, we would call it in the Orthodox Church, which is, which is essentially the spirit of man, right? The higher intellectual uh, part of the soul. And, and so that, that whole science, which is at the heart of Orthodox Christian life, is, doesn't really exist, to my knowledge, outside of Orthodoxy. The, I, I've never seen it. So let me ask you, you, you use the word science. That's interesting. There's a spiritual science. Mm -hmm. that's akin to or uh, runs parallel to what we might call a material science? Are there two sciences? How do you see science as known to us in the West versus the way you just describe science? That's interesting to me. Well, we say the West. I mean, I, I, my guess is there's a variety of versions of the Western ver vision. I mean, if you want to go back to the West of, of the Middle Ages, it's not the same as the West today. But I think what you mean is contemporary West, which is atheist or scientism or scientific. Correct. West, right? The Enlightenment's yeah. version yeah. of post science. Post Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you you have an anthropology and a cosmology which is radically different, if not the inversion of the old world traditional vision of man. And so uh, obviously science is going to be limited to what their epistemology allows, which they don't really, they don't really accept and understand uh, the, the, uh, the spiritual world, uh, the, uh, the presuppositions of the, of, uh, that exist for us, which are so important that they, they, they dismiss. And so immediately they're going to be closing their door. Their science is going to be more limited, actually, not more open. And to the material world? It's going to be limited to the material world because that they've they've come to the conclusion that that's all that can be that's, you know demonstrated to uh, through through uh, you know experimentation and and examination empirically mm -hmm. with with the rational intellect. But we would say as Orthodox on many levels, but the most basic level, the anthropological anthropological level, they're they're limiting not only they're limiting first of all man to the rational intellect. And there's, they're, they're totally ignorant of the spirit of man, and the, which is the, the higher part of the intellect, right? The noose in the Orthodox tradition. So right there, they're cutting off. They're, like, they're, they're, they're beheading, as it were, the man to, and, and ignoring his mm -hmm. deeper inner self, the spiritual life, the spiritual man, the deep man, the real uh, deep human being. And then along with that, they're examining the, those higher things with an organ, the rational intellect, which is meant to examine the lower things. So if, if there was a humility and an acceptance of the higher things and a use of the rational intellect for the lower things, those two things would be in total concert. There'd be harmony. And that's what we believe as Orthodox there is. If you have an Orthodox outlook, you have no problem with the the material world and the findings of science on that level, but you don't apply those and you don't, you don't examine the higher things with that tool, which is God gave you to examine and to live by this, this temporal life. This, so this, wow. the anthropology changes the outlook. It is definitely a part of the old world vision. And therefore, you know, this the old world, new world, you can talk about all the daily effects on our life, like in this village and how we treat one another and how we see communal life. And I mean, we, I think we should, we should get back to that because that's going to be helpful to a lot of people, but actually it runs really deep, right? And it makes sense that it runs deep, right? It's not mm -hmm. just a no, official. It, it runs really, I mean, okay, I'm going to go there right now because what you have right now in this world that we're the COVID world is you have all these takes, like I like sports, you know that. There's all mm -hmm. these hot takes every morning. I try not to listen to them about what happened with games the night before. And there's hot takes. LeBron. But now there's hot takes about COVID. And most of the hot takes are scientific in nature, new world science. And what are you seeing from your village in Greece as per these hot takes? Are, are they getting the picture right? Is there something you would add to the take on what COVID is? Is there some, is because scientifically, I think people have a handle that there's some sort of virus that people are acquiring that can be very bad for you and that can kill you, but most likely uh, uh, people who have a certain type of underlying conditions. And then everyone just goes, done. Is there something else happening <laughs> from the old world perspective? Because uh, you said they missed 
they're unable to analyze because mm. they've, they've mm. de-hearted themselves or de yes. themselves. Is there something else going on from the Eastern perspective? Yeah, I think we, one of the things the Lord Jesus Christ says is the judge of fruit, uh, a tr- uh, the, the tree by its fruits, right? So, and, and, and in this examination of what's going on, we're not going to be limiting ourselves to a narrow examination of the latest, you know, uh, data from the health center. We're not going to be limiting ourselves to the, the latest take by the politicians. We're going to be seeing this thing in context. We're going to see it in historical context and, and, and ge- geographical context. And we're going to, we're going to be a true and proper examination of any phenomenon is going to be Catholic. It's going to be holistic, right? And so we're not. We're not going to, so if you look, you, you put all those things into your into your truthometer. You know, uh, you're gonna you're hey, gonna get a. That. Yeah, you're gonna cool. get. That was a reference to my earlier lightometer science, right? Yes, exactly. The hot. science, the science of truth, right? Yes. Truth finding, truth loving. Truthometer, keep going. I love yeah, it. Yeah, if you put all that in there and you get a whole whole you know the whole picture, uh, you're going to come to a lot of different conclusions. So here in Greece, uh, on the ground among the people uh, that I know, and of course you know I don't know everybody, and I'm I'm, I'm going to be around a lot of Orthodox Christians. There's tremendous skepticism if not outright rejection of the, of the narrative, the coronavirus narrative that has been, you know, fed us uh, globally, but also by the media and the, the government in, in Greece. And there's just great skepticism. We've learned uh, the hard way in Greece, and I think that everybody should be learning this by now, that, that through a lot of trial in the last 20 years, but not just 20 years, going way back, that, you know, to not not to be skeptical and not trust the first thing that comes out of the mouth of the prime minister or the minister of health or whatever, and to look deeper and to look deeper and to, and and to, and to and to look uh, not just um, uh, you know in the community but also to examine things on a spiritual level. So what what's going on spiritually and intellectually is that we have we're not using our brain. You know, mm-hmm. we're not <laughs> as one of the commentators here in Greece says, Father Arsenios. He says. Put your brain to work in his, in his uh, mm. continually saying that, you know, it does this make sense? What they're telling you, does it make sense? You know, there's so many things, so many inconsistencies. There's so many things that just don't add up. Like it was going to be a lockdown for two weeks because we didn't want to overload the, uh, the uh, hospitals. Mm-hmm. And now here we are six months later and they're talking about a lockdown for months and in Australia, they have a lockdown for, I mean, it, th- put your mind to work. The things don't add up. And if you look at it in the whole context of globalization, you look at it in the whole context of, of, of the changes they want to bring in on a global level, governance, economics, and all the rest, they're connected. It's all connected. So, and, and so, so yeah. is that, that analysis. So, in part, that analysis is, is rational. A lot of people in America who aren't maybe flexing their traditional spiritual muscles also come to a similar conclusion. Is that analysis in part because you're using a, a, a fuller uh, analytical tools, mind, body, and soul? Could you keep going with that? Is there something else you're seeing? Because yeah, I no, think I've, you can yeah, come to that conclusion without having necessarily. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I have not gone anywhere near the deeper spiritual ramifications and analysis. So I'm giving you, I'm giving you the, you know. Step the, one. The, step one. Yeah. Do you want Would to, you, do you want to mess around with that? I, I do a little as long as you, you what do you I think? mean, if you, if you want to get into some heavy, spiritual, spiritual. Some he- heavy in a light way, some heavy spiritual and intellectual. And Can I keep stuff. it light if you go down that road? Because I don't even know what you're about to say. I actually don't. I swear to you. Look, uh, it, it, as an Orthodox Christian, we live to understand where I would go. First, you got to, I mean, there's a lot I got to unpack, right? So, but, so we're not gonna be able to do that well. So okay, I, I, fair I, point. I beg the indulgence of the listener to understand that there's a, there's a ton of stuff that presupposed is presupposed when I talk about this stuff, right? And it's, it, you got to see it in context. But look, as an Orthodox Christian, we live eschatologically. What does that mean? We live with our we live always with our mind up in toward the heavens. Like life is is very temp- temporary here. It's it's mm-hmm. short. And as an Orthodox Christian, we, uh, we're, we're expecting the second coming. We're expecting our, our, the, our death and therefore the judgment. And we're expecting the eternal life. And that's where we're going to see this life, this history within that context. And, 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 and that's how we're going to understand things. So the alpha 
and the omega of history is very, very important. How the origins of man and the end of the world, those two things are, are the book ends, right? And that's our library. We, we, we're, we're, between those two things, that's what we're going to be understanding the, the present time. So I cannot but look at what's going on right now in an eschatological way if I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to understand this as the process of the working out of salvation, right? But also of, the mystery of iniquity, which is which is what St. Paul talks about in the scriptures. He's talking about a mystery of, of evil, which is working in the world to bring about the, uh, the damnation, essentially, of humanity, right? So there's these two mysteries going on, and that, those two things govern uh, what, so much of how we're going to interpret what's going on. And we're going to look at, we're going to look at the motivations. We're going to look at the principles. We're going to look at the, the end game of, of, of the globalist of the so-called elite. We're going to, all that's going to be a part of our analysis. We're not going to just walk out and, and, and think about things on a very, you know, temporal. I mean, that's what Christ came to free us from is this, is this, is this very limited vision of humanity, which is mm-hmm. basically we're an exalted, we're exalted animal, right? We're going to see ourselves in the context of the eschaton of the end of all things. So that's going to bring us in, in, in to see in, to examine these things in terms of the apostasy of man from God and the the coming of the man of iniquity who is the Antichrist, and that's all that's all talked about in scriptures, talked about in the Book of Revelation. That's all going to be a part of our analysis if we're going to be orthodox. And I would say that's the biggest problem with the people you talked about who come to those conclusions. Yeah, there's a ton of people coming to conclusions. They're saying, "Wait, something's wrong." But do they understand it in the larger context? Do they have the alpha and omega of history? Do they understand what where they're coming from and where they're where they're going so, to make sense of what's happening right now? So check it out. As you know, I've been a teacher and, and a professor and dip deep deeply dipped in East Coast educational elitism. And I was listening to your answer. And if we were on a boat, a lot of my friends over time who I love to this day right now. They were jumping off as you made that little right hand turn. <laughs> I felt them all like, yeah, 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 whoa! And then I felt about I don't know, a hundred thousand people just start jumping off the boat because, and not because I obviously I don't think you're wrong, but because you did move it, the whole conversation about COVID into this sort of celestial battle between good and evil. Did you feel it go that way? Yeah, I felt it, yeah, and I feel like that is. That is a that is a real elbow, a change, a, a, a hinge that that really stands between the old and new world. It's like when you elevate, or I think my my secular friends, when you devolve and degrade the conversation into that kind of antichrist conversation, you lose them or they lose us, and then you flip it around, and that also becomes the way that you lose that we lose them. And what's your response to that? So what, right? Well, give me your alpha and omega. What's the end game for you? I'll play your anth- What's your anthropology? What's your cosmology? Show me. What, what are you basing all your, your ultimate things? Like, do you have an examination of the ultimate things? Or are you just looking like a, you're just a speck in the universe and you accept that you're, you're, you, know, you don't have any meaning at the well, end I'll of the day? Play, uh, call me Steve Smith for a second. Uh, I'll say this. My alpha and omega is, is basically I was born into the world as a super smart monkey that's meant to do all kinds of things to make the world that I'm going to give to my kids better. And when I die, I won't really know if that happened, but on my deathbed, I might, and it might just be a reward enough. So what? Yeah. So that kind of vision of man is tragic. And I don't see how anybody could avoid tremendous depression and, 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 and psychological problems with that kind of vision of human beings. So now Steve Smith's got psychological problems. Uh, I would if I was Steve Smith. <laughs> okay, I mean, what, what is life about if that's all it is? We're just an exalted monkey. What's going on? What's the point? Well, like that's nihilism. Hey, that's nihilism. They should, they, should, they should go read a little bit of Nietzsche and understand where they belong. But I see beauty in a lot of things while I'm alive on the world walking around. Well, why don't we take that beauty that you see and and – transform and translate it and transfer it to the origin of that beauty right and give glory to the one who created that that's that's the that's going to be a completion of that 
initial, that's in, in you, you have the image, right, of God. So you're going to do that. That's going to be a part of our life, no matter if you oh, deny yeah, theoretically or not. That's a part of the human being. But it's not going to be fulfilled. It's not going to be complete until they give glory. So let's talk about he, people maybe will be help, helped by understanding the Orthodox Christian understanding of the fall of Lucifer, of, the, of, the, of Satan. Mm -hmm. Because right there you can see the, the, the heart of the problem with uh, with, I think, modern man in many ways. He was the greatest of the angels. He was the first, the morning star, the brightest. And instead of giving glory for that greatness to the origin of the light, which he reflected, but was not the origin, he turned in on himself, egotism, and he said, I am the origin. I don't need that light, that, 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 um, the origin. I don't need God. And I am, and he turned in on himself and he, ceased to give glory and uh, to attribute to the origin of his own glory. And therefore he fell from that relationship, that communion that he had with that glory. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that, that turning in on us is essentially the fall, right? And not giving glory. So if you, if you truly see beauty in, in all of creation, how can you miss the beauty of Christ? How can you miss the beauty of God who is the author of all beauty? That's the question we all have to you know, so this is really interesting. And again, this is, I, I could hit another button here because I know you, but I don't, there are no bad buttons because it's all said in love, but you don't sound unlike so many old world people I know. And so one of the theories on this pod and really in our work is, is, is everyone thinks there's a big black and white divide. There's a big rich and poor divide, but I'm telling you, in our experiences working overseas and trying to shed ourselves of our selfishness and all those things in order to serve local people who are in really tough situations. We see this divide, the one you're talking about. Like we were talking to a woman, Adama in, in Sierra Leone, she's a Muslim. And my buddy was sick, uh, Daniel. And he had basically a fever and two, <laughs> two pink eyes and went to try to get a little grub out of it. He was living in this cute little mud house and he went to her and she laughed and he said, uh, yeah, it's not that funny. I actually don't feel well. She said, no, no. I laughed because you don't realize what's happening. You've been blessed in your suffering. You'll, you'll actually remember God. And he took his peanuts and went home. <laughs> you, you sound a lot more like her than say, the professor that I'm pretending to be. I, you really do. I don't know how to, now, what do you think about that? Because that, Yeah, well, I think that she's right about that. Absolutely. That's the, that's the uh, mystery of the cross that she's talking about, which is the, that which frees us and uh, redeems us. But I, I want to say something about division, because I think this is sure, a very important sure. thing today. You talk about the divisions, and, and all of these divisions are not, they don't exist. They're all a delusion. There, there's no division. There's only one division that matters. The only one that will, that will be extended into eternity, and that is between faith and faithlessness, between trust and lack of trust. That's the division of all of humanity. There's only two groups of human beings, black, white, Chinese, whatever it is, men, women. It's, from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, if you read St. Paul, you read the Lord, teachings, there's only one division that matters, and that is, do you trust or you do not trust? Do you trust God? Do you trust Christ? Because he's the incarnate presence of God, or do you not? And he said it himself. I mean, it was said about him when he was, a, when he was just a, a child. It's, it was prophesied by Simeon. He said, this will be for the rise and fall of many. He will be a sign to be spoken of. And uh, spoken against. And what that means is that he will be this flashpoint. He will be this crisis of every human being. Do you accept him or do you reject him? And, and so at the end of the day, you can, you can see everywhere. It's always the same thing again. And how much trust do you have in God and how much trust do you have in yourself? That's, that's everywhere in the church, outside the church. It's so, so basic to human, the human person. I, I think that helps again, with the thesis on this pod, let me push back just a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm growing up, I'm 18, I'm 17, I'm heading off to wherever I'm going. And someone says, just trust in yourself. Don't be afraid. Go for it. Because that's what, believe me, as a high school teacher and as a professor of college kids, that's happening. Okay, pretty much in every classroom. Go for it. You got this. 
is that what you mean by reducing trust in yourself? I mean, is that a bad phrase? What's going on with that phrase? That's a very, they, very psychological phrase that we use here. Yeah. I mean, they might say trust in yourself, but if they really are honest, uh, it, it, it's, it's a deeper trust in God's providence. They just don't want to recognize it intellectually. And they're not saying like, who am I? Like what, a, I mean, trust in myself, my abilities. Well, we all have some abilities and some more than others, but it's, there's a deeper trust that one has to have to set out alone. Uh, and, and those that ultimately that trust goes back to a, a divine providence for my life. I mean, if, if I really just have trust in myself, I'm not going to do much because if I have self knowledge of who I am, I'm going to, I'm going to realize I'm very weak. Every human being is very weak without God. So I don't think that, it, it, you know, they don't say that in true self-knowledge of who they are, and they don't really mean just in your self-trust. I see. Ultimately, you see what I mean? What about the teachers, though, that are saying it? Let me just put it this way. In my experiences in the cultures of the schools where I teach, teachers are not meaning this phrase. is You can do it. It's all within you. Everything you need is within you. They're not meaning everything within, is within you slash that's God. They actually just mean everything is within, you know, little Johnny. And I always find it disingenuous. Now I'm showing my colors and on education, I let stuff rip too. That self-esteem concept. I mean, I don't want to curse. And so I won't mom, but Lord have mercy. That thing is, that's like a virus. So father, this self-esteem question, you mentioned earlier something about, you know, sort of the human loop and it ends in nihilism and self-love or you didn't call it self-love, but the idea of doing it yourself might be a dead end. But I can tell you there's a lot of self-esteem being taught regularly all the time, commonly. I don't know that it's tied to this God concept inside of people. Is that a problem? I mean, would you rewrite that self-esteem curriculum? as a new world uh, experiment? So I think people were, people, I mean, this idea of self-esteem developed up because they lost the sense of being esteemed by God, right? So when you have that security, that you know that God loves you, that you are his child, and that you are in his grace and in his protection and his care, you don't have, you're not looking for some other source of power and strength. And so therefore this whole self-esteem thing is almost a non-issue. And, and so we're not against the esteeming the human being, God forbid. No, we, we have a great esteem. I would say the Christian, Orthodox Christian vision of the human being, there is nothing like it. We have it, human beings, are, there's nothing higher on the face of the earth in terms of the esteem of a, a religious body for the human person. Hmm. Because we say God became man. And so God loved us so much that he became man. And so our human person, human being, has been elevated to the, to, to the heavens, right? So, so in Orthodox Christianity, this whole search for self-esteem, it doesn't exist, doesn't, it's not a problem in, in the Orthodox Christian experience. And, and so it's a non-issue. So I guess what I would say is, you know, we esteem the other human being, but we don't sit and focus on ourselves and... And, and become egocentric and, 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 and try to prop ourselves up. We don't, we don't feel any need to do that uh, because we feel that God is doing that. Like, and we feel his, his presence that he keeps us propped up and going and, Got it. and feeling good about life. And Does that make sense? The we here is the Orthodox tradition. Yeah. 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 Sure. The experience oh. we have it in, in the church. Uh -huh. I got it. And so can you just do, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say in the old world, you know, because we're talking about old world, new world, that that's that's transfer that's seen or experienced through the community because of the love of the brethren, right? So if you have a vibrant community, a vibrant family life with lots of children and lots of things going on and lots of, and there's love, true love for one another, you're not going to be going searching for self esteem. You're going to you're going to feel esteemed by your by your uh, community, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's that's a part of this whole theology that I'm talking about. What would you say, one of the traditions in the new world is the tradition of freedom. It's a specific type of freedom that's passed down. And I, I mean, I can 
I can attest to it in my own life and you can attest to it too. And that freedom, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, but the notion of that freedom, the, the definition of it in the West is freedom to do as I conceive, right? I can do what I need to do. One of the, one of the arguments is, is the old world was laced with and, and wrought with non-freedom or uh, versions of slavery now i don't uh, there is the slavery of people but also there's in there's right prohibitions on everything what would you say is that what's one of the good things about the new world i mean is that true so um i think though from the you know my experience as an orthodox priest we would the orthodox church was never has never been, never will be for any kind of enslavement of the human person. And so whatever, whatever that, that, that was happening because of totalitarian regimes or whatever, obviously that we were in the 20th century, we were the Orthodox church was the most persecuted of any Orthodox of any Christian or any religion on the face of the earth through uh, Soviet atheistic uh, totalitarianism. So we're, we're definitely against all that, but uh, it begs the, the, I think deeper, there's the, the deeper question of freedom is really interesting. And that is that uh, we don't, uh, we're not against that temporal freedom. And we think governments should be limited and all the rest. We're very low, you know, government uh, incursion, but that's that freedom to do what you want. If it's, if you've not been freed from the slavery of the passions and even up and freed from the ultimate slavery, which is death, that freedom is just short lived and it's not really ultimate. It's not an ultimate. We want to be free as human beings from being enslaved internally to, to, to all of the inclinations toward evil and toward, and toward sin. And so uh, if we're free from incursions from, you know, the outside to do that, then that's a great thing. But if, if, if that's not a part of this equation and that's not a part of why we were free, right, to do that, then, 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 it, then it's very short-lived and temporal and it doesn't seem to be for us to, to be true freedom at all. Does that make sense? Is that what yeah, you're looking but can for? You, but can you, have, can you have a freedom that doesn't ultimately, I mean, this is Dostoevsky now, right? This is the Grand Inquisitor. Doesn't all freedom just sort of mean that people will hurt themselves in various ways? And isn't that part of the equation then? Because I'm fallen. I'm small and confused. And, and now you've given me freedom. Good. Doesn't it mean that in some ways you're going to have to allow me to hurt myself, to do dumb things? Mm -hmm. Isn't that part of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the risk that we take. But, but, but see, we, we've seen the potential of the human person in Christ. And so we have great optimism and expectations for the human person. And so we don't look down at him and say, you, you pathetic thing, we need to, as the Grand Inquisitor did, you know, we need to um, feed you, uh, the, you know, keep you uh, down because you're going to misuse your freedom. In, in our vision of the human person, the potential is so great to use it with, for good and, for, and for, in a blessed way. And that's what we have to work for. And there's certainly no solution to cut that off and, and ignore that because we're afraid of the opposite. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it comes with the territory. Yeah, it's the risk. The, I mean, the, Lord, the, the Lord himself, or Christ himself, took this risk, right? He, people often say that to me. Say, Why has God allowed uh, this, that, and the other thing, the terrible things that go on in the world? Well, because the opposite is a bunch of puppets and no, no love at all right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to take away the freedom of human beings to do evil, then you also have taken away the freedom to do good and to be in communion with good and to communion with God. Uh, it's, it, you can't, you can't uh, otherwise the, there's, no, there's not a loving God. And I think a lot of people have come to that conclusion because they've not known the, the loving God. And so they end up in this mechanistic world and they and they and it's it, they and there i think a lot of the elite today frankly is is thinking like that about human beings we need to control the masses because they're the, they're the grand inquisitors of our day right these massive uh, wealthy individuals and all the rest who are who are really interested in 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 in, in uh, manipulating and controlling the world for their good quote unquote uh and that that's something we would be very much against in the hey, Let's end with this because I think we're going to do a part two down the road. Uh, I just know that 
there's more to say, but I really, you know what? We didn't, we didn't argue. <laughs> we stopped arguing a while ago. I stopped worrying about if I was bad or good compared to my little brother. And I started thinking, I'm going to die. I better get to it, man. And it was really, because, you know, again, you went hard at your, at your purpose. It was quite impressive. I mean, didn't you start at a monastery? Didn't you head into a monastery when you left for Greece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I went. That's why I came to Greece to go to the monastery, Mount Athos. So there was a, like a, a type of purity already set up for you in your mind. You wanted the good stuff all the way in, right? When you left. Uh, I still think I do. I mean, I think we all should, and we all, that should be the aim of our life. We should, we should aim for perfection and, um, and believe that, you know, we can't do it, but God can. And so if we do that, then there's great things that can happen in our life. Right. It's really a beautiful thing. But so in doing that, what I started to realize is basically there's all these variations on acting beautifully in the world. And I think what happened with the foundation, Ryan and I, when we got started was we saw a, a way, a way to be beautiful and to add some light. And that was fundamentally to stop treating highly, highly impoverished neighborhoods as somehow needing our help. <laughs> and so we started saying, maybe we need that help. And that help comes in the form of a two, two and a half year immersion where we strip ourselves of maybe some of the pride and arrogance. And in the meantime, we take our Western mindset, which is filled with a lot of, you got to mad, you got to, you got to recognize a lot of practicalities, right? We're really pragmatic. We're good at solving problems in the West. And what we tried to do was sit in, sit in that space and then listen carefully in the local language and then hear people and respond to their needs rather than go with a plan for them, you know, rather than go with electrification here will serve the, the needs of this community. And so what we tried to do is I think there was an orthodox ethos in all of this to say, first, I decrease so that the folks I'm trying to serve may increase. And in some way, that's God. So why am I, why am I telling you all this? Because I've come to peace with that. And then as directing first things and trying to figure out what life is all about, I think what's happened is, is I found a way to say that I'm useful. That's not necessarily clerical. It's not necessarily hierarchical, but it is serviceable. Is this fit in a worldview from the old world? Is it, mm -hmm. is it make sense? So at the heart of the, of the good old world, you know, because obviously the old world is a mixed bag, just like the whole world is. But the heart of the good old world, the things which you imitate, is is what the Greek people say, what they call is philotimo, philotimo, and that that is this this. Um, I mean, literally, it means love of honor. But what it really means in the spiritual life is this out this zeal to outdo the other in good, to put themselves in the position of the other, to f to put themselves in the in the place of the other, and then to think what do they need and want and then the struggle and strive to do that without any kind of self-interest or any kind of desire to, you know, to manipulate the situation, but simply out of love. And when that happens, then we have total transformation. We have uh, of, of the both parties mm -hmm. involved. And, and, and to give you an old world, new world example of the stance that I would say it, the philotimo stance on the one hand and the, the rationalistic kind of new world scientific, you know, analysis on the other in relations, human relationships. One of the things that blew me away when I, when I was coming to Greece is, is the, is the hospitality of the Greek people. And in particular, you know, we, I, we would go out with friends when I was, you know, in college 20, 22 years ago here. And, and, and we would sit down with four or five people at the table. I've said this before, but it's really a good example of, of the old world, new world, philotimo, you know, uh, individualistic on the one hand. and philo Not to say that this is, uh, this is a stereotype, okay? Obviously, yes, there are many. Right. I, I understand. But we're trying, to, we're trying to learn something. It's not that ever. So when I went to, you know, meals back in my day in college or whatever, everybody would pull out at the end of the meal their, you know, money to pay for their portion of the, of the, of the, of the meal. And, you know, very few people would say, well, no, 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 I'll pay for you. That would be a rare occurrence in my experience. When I came to Greece, uh, it would be uh, this, uh, this challenge or this, this struggle to make sure that I paid 
before anybody else even understood that I paid and I would pay for the whole table. <laughs> and, and then, you know, so there was a zeal for just doing the beautiful thing, doing the right thing and making people happy and not looking at the, at the, the interest that I would get out of it or the gain I would get out of it or whatever. Now there's a, there could be a little bit of pride in that. Like I'm going to do it better and you're going to, and I'm going to stand. So that's why Philotimo actually could be, you know, a love of honor for the praise of others. That's a possibility, but it's still very much a part of the Greek of the Greek mentality, Greek society. And I think that when you approach the third world, like you're talking about, you go to those people, you're working with them. Um, you know, if you go in like, you know, I'm here to show you not who, what I know or to tell you what to do, but I'm here to love you, serve you. And in that stance, you can't, but gain a brother. You can't, but it gain happens. a it relationship. Happens. Yeah. And so that transforms immediately the relationships. If that's your stance. Can I tell you, well, I'll tell everybody, there was a, uh, during my work with, uh, in the Georgian Republic during the Abkhazian Civil War, and we went up into a village and they threw this big supra, this big, this big table, this party. And I, of course, was the, the Westerner. And at the, in 95, 96, I was the first Westerner down there along the Turkish border because it was where NATO met essentially the old Soviet uh, Union. And so I was like superstar, right? And I went down to this <laughs> this feast and brother, I tried to pay at the end. <laughs> I remember this. I'm talking, there's like 20 elders at this table and they're having these toasts. And at the end, like just like stood up and tried to pay. I uh, The guy almost literally fought me in front of everybody i had done something terrible he looked at me and he said put that away right now and i was like no i really and i tried to put my money on the table and i'm not kidding one of the guys took the money put it down real quickly and the the, the tamada he turned to me and he said sit down and he was not it was a bad bad feeling and i <laughs> a in a matter of about a second i thought i was gonna get punched <laughs> crazy yeah that's the stuff and then i remember being shaken by that right you're know, like wait a minute hold on bro like i'm not trying to show you up and then you realize i couldn't have paid it it, it wasn't possible because i i wasn't an individual there i had been in i've been i had been subsumed at the table and i'm now with him and if i do anything to dishonor that moment i, I really put myself at risk it was interesting you're also you're also you're also a hospitality it's a question of hospitality that you were a guest right oh yeah oh yeah for sure but you know i was the the Western aid guest. I, so in my mind, I'm like, well, I don't want. Oh, that was doubly bad. That was doubly I know, bad. Oh, I know. But I, like, I <laughs> that arrogant American is going to pay for us now. Who does he think he is? I know. <laughs> I, what I was thinking is, is because now watch, literally, I can say the entirety of our work is founded on this moment in some ways. Because watch, this was my thought. And there's a lot of people listening who are going to go, yeah, I get that. But don't get it because it's bad. This was my thought. You know, I don't want them to put out more because they're already in a state of crisis. And so I don't want them to suffer more just because I'm here. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, a, that's that sick, like, I don't know, what do you call that? Like this pietistic, it's, like... <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a type of Puritanism. It's a weird yeah, it's pietistic, like, I, I have to help everyone. Instead of like, I have a lot of problems. Thank you for allowing me at your table. What a blessing. There, there is a virtue in accepting people, their generosity and their hospitality. I mean, there, there could be a real vice of arrogance when you don't do that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that people have to learn. Uh, it's, not, wow. it's not immediately. Believe yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but let's, let's, let's end it there for now. And was it did it go okay or is it weirder than you thought because you have i mean we speak but we didn't speak on microphones oh no, it's good i think i think that w there's a, a lot more we could talk about on a personal level i think maybe next time when we get together we could do that we could delve into some more of the personal day-to-day -day differences if you want to get into you know what what an american in greece in the you know 2000 yeah. oh yeah uh, i i mean i okay that's what we'll do part two we'll actually just talk about day to day and ed education is what I, I mean you have five kids i want to get into 
what it's like raising kids in the old mm. school. Now, remember, there's old school Greece, right? And then there's Greece. There's, there's really two ways to, to live in Greece now, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Greece has definitely been, you know, Europeanized in many ways. And not I don't I don't mean that in terms of technology and road work. I mean in terms of mentality. So there's a struggle, a struggle going on all over the world, everywhere, mm -hmm. between the old world and the new world. And of course the old world is 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 outnumbered for sure. You really want to get into it? Okay, let's do a teaser, then we're gonna go. I'll do the outro too. But here's a teaser. And now this is gonna cause a lot of people some angst, but I was in New York for 9-11 and I was pissed and it was bad and people died and it was awful. As I've grown in this work, those planes and going into that building, there's so much to that in this old world, new world debate. There's so much to it. It's not that I became aware of why they would do it and said, way to go, guys. It's that you go, oh, oh, that's what they're thinking. And it starts to really illuminate this issue of the old world and the new world. There is a deep fear of a lot of what the new world offers in terms of, uh, well, degradation of old world culture. And there's a lot of really barbaric violence that can come out of old world mentality. And I just thought I was never so clear on the division and when I started to learn about Islam and living overseas and what it meant. And it's really fascinating. Maybe we get into that. That seems crazy, mm. right? Yeah, it's interesting because the old world in this part of the world sees the uh, Northern European Western uh, uh, ethics as, as um, allowing for brutality and, 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 the, and, you know, impersonal destruction of culture and identity. And I think that's, that's what, that's when they look at America, they say, this is the end of my identity as a whatever. Aha. Uh, that, there you <clears throat> go. That's right. And that's the identity question wrapped up. Let's do that. Let's do that. We'll do that in another time. But for right now, I want to thank you, brother, father, Peter, father, Peter hears, um, check out Orthodox ethos with him. Um, and check out his Patreon page because your classes are, they're well attended. Hundreds of people get on those things. Um, and keep going, man. And next time, yeah, we'll joke some more about some of our childhood experiences. So I just want to say thank you. Shenis Gagimarjos. That means to you guys out there who are listening, victory, victory to you. It's often said at the super table in Georgia. That's our pod for today. Thanks for coming along. Watar, that's why are we talking about rabbits. Watar is produced by Andrew Schwartz and Daniel Paternos. Our pod is brought to you by the creators of First Things Foundation. That's our nonprofit that lives and works in some of the world's toughest neighborhoods. We immerse there in order to create momentum for local change makers, folks we call impresarios. We try to assist them and their vision of a better life. Share Watar with friends. Hit us up with a solid review on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcast, your love for us allows us to love and serve others. So Nakvam Dis, hasta luego, Kambufo, that's the bomb term. Father Peter, how would I say goodbye in, in Greek? Uh, yasas. Yasas. I, I kind of knew that one, actually. <laughs> Did I say it right? Yasas. I love language. Stokalo. 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 <laughs> to the good, Stokalo. Stokalo. Herete. <laughs> Yeah. Rejoice. Rejoice is another way to say it. Herete. Herete. Check out Father Peter. Uh, and um, if you have questions, check out our pod notes. So everybody, peace out and see you next week.